Hello and welcome to the first lecture of the Unit 5 over the American Revolution. Um, so obviously this unit will be covering the war and um, some battles and some the outcome. Um, but in this specific lecture we will be looking at the early years of the war and some of the divisions in America. Separating from Britain obviously divided America. That means that some people were for it, some people were for it were against it. Um, 20 to 30 percent were loyalists, which means that they um, supported Britain and they wanted the British to win or do well. And 40 to 45 percent were patriots, which means that they supported the Americans or the rebels. And the rest of the population was neutral, which means that they do not have really a um, they do not favor either side. They do not have an opinion on it, really. In New England, and Virginia, there were more patriots. Um, and then in the cities and the southern colonies, there would be more loyalists. Um, if you look over here at this map, you will notice that the red areas are where loyalists are, and that is exactly right around some larger cities. The reason that a loyalist would be in the city more often would have to do with the fact that these people in the cities are they are um, relying on trade to make their money and at this time they are a lot of them most of them if not all of their trade is going through Britain and if they are at a war with Britain and not supporting Britain they won't be able to trade with Britain and that means they're not gonna make any money so these people who are living in the cities and trading they would uh, rather Britain win problems with the army. This is problems with the Continental Army. We will be looking at some problems that they have and also some problems that the British have. At first the Continental Army was made up of groups of untrained volunteers but um, what George Washington knows is that these groups of untrained volunteers could not win a large battle until they were well trained and probably had a um, larger number of people in the army. His job, George Washington, who is the commander of the Continental Army, is just to keep the revolution alive. That means that he has to, you know, he knows that he can't win any big battles. He just needs to win a few battles here and there and avoid a really, really large defeat. Um, a crushing defeat that would make everybody just like, oh, we give up. We don't want to do this revolution thing anymore. It's too hard. At first, men in the Continental Army would only enlist for a year, which was a big problem. After the year was up, they would go home and a new group of men would arrive. Um, basically, a few. this presents a few problems. One is if you think about if you were to start a business, let's say we were, we were going to start a McDonald's and we have, we're going to have 15 employees working at this McDonald's restaurant. Well, at first they would know nothing about how to run McDonald's machinery or, you know, how to cook the food or whatever the case may be. But after six months, they would be a little bit better at it. And then after a year, they would all be very good at what they were doing. They would know exactly how to do it. They would be well trained. Everything would be running smoothly. They'd be good at what they were supposed to do. Um, but at the end of that year, let's say, all 15 of those people leave and we have to get 15 new people. Well that leaves us in the situation where we are back to kind of square one. We have 15 new people that don't know what they're doing. This means also that the army was never larger than 17,000 men. Um, the British have about 50,000 50, plus regular troops and um, you know if you are good at math, 17,000 is a lot less than 50,000. And, you know, that's not, not to mention that these men are not very well trained. Congress la lacked the power to properly supply the army um, because the Congress at this time, they, they cannot tax um, people and they just don't have, or, or make laws, which means that they just don't have the power to you know get money from the states to properly supply the army um, so they don't have any money that's that's the problem congress can't do anything to get the army food and blankets and things like that one of the problems that the british have 
is that they are very overconfident. They um, they see the Americans as disorganized rebels who are going to be easily defeated. Um, many British, because of this, are not enthusiastic about the war. They just think that, oh, we're going to go over there, they're going to be beaten, it's going to be whatever, it's going to be done. Um, but So this means that the king has a very difficult time recruiting troops. He, um, he does not... There's just not a lot of um, support, so people don't want to go over there. Um, people don't see the point. Another reason why he has a hard time um, recruiting troops is that enlistment is for life in Britain, and nobody, not a lot of people really want to sign up to fight an army for life. Um, so because they do not have many soldiers, they have to hire mercenaries, which... A mercenary is a professional soldier who is hired to fight for a foreign country. And in this case, they get the Hessians, who are from Germany. So they go over to Germany and they say, hey, we need some soldiers. And people sign up and, you know, we'll pay you. Um, and that's, they're from a foreign country. They are from Germany. They're going to be fighting for Britain, going over to America and fighting. One of Britain's goals is to capture large cities on the coast. One of those large cities that they're trying to control is New York. Um, American spirits, after this defeat in New York, they've been fighting for several months. Um, they haven't been winning many battles. Um, and the American spirits of the troops and of just the people all over um, are very low. And Washington knows that he needs a victory to kind of boost everyone's spirits. So he devises a plan. Late on December 25th, 1776, Washington and his troops rode across the icy Delaware um, to New Jersey. This is that famous picture um, down here of George Washington crossing the Delaware River. They mounted a surprise attack on the British troops that were um, staying across the Delaware River, and they killed or captured more than 900 of those Hessian mercenaries that were fighting for the British and gained a lot of needed supplies. They then march to Princeton and win another battle there. And so with these battles, people start to be believe in Washington, and more people or more Americans start to sign up to fight in the Continental Army. So we have some momentum here. Things are going a little bit better for us. Um, now the British, their first strategy is the Northern strategy. They, their plan is to control the Hudson River, which is going to let them cut off New England from the rest of the states. Um, they believe that to do, by doing this, they will kind of kill the revolution because they think that the New England colonies or the states are, are the source of the rebellion. They think that once they cut that part off, there won't be any more of this drive to, you know, support the revolution or anything like that. They planned for, the plan here is the, for three army groups, three British army groups, to meet all at once in Albany which is near the head of the Hudson River, and then that would allow them to control the Hudson River. Um, the three army groups, uh, General uh, Burgoyne, would march down from the south, from Canada. Leger would come from the west to the east through the Mohawk River Valley, and General Howe would come from up the Hudson River. So this is the plan. So what's going to end up happening is that the these people from Leger and Howe are not going to end up in coming to Albany for various reasons, and Burgoyne is going to be the only one that is on his way to Albany. It was very full, it, his march was very slow. Um, the countryside is filled with min or militiamen in the woods, and then they would you know cut down trees over the roads, which means that the um, supplies of the British would have to, you know, they'd have to unpack their wagons or their carts or whatever and go around these trees or, you know, cut up the trees and move them out of the way. People, just regular citizens, would also, throughout the countryside, burn crops and drive cattle off, leaving the British with no food. So as the British march, they would expect to find some fields with, you know, corn or anything in them that they can 
eat. They would just take it from the people that are living there. But what's happening is that these people are not just letting them take this food. They are instead burning it. They are saying, you know, if if I'm not going to get paid for this food anyway, so I'd rather just burn it and the British not have it than to, you know, leave it there for them to eat. So what this does is it makes the British army very weak because they are not having any supplies. And this is not the army doing this to the British. This is not the Continental Army doing this to the British. This is just normal citizens. So what the British realizes that they were not just fighting an army, they are fighting an entire country of people. Um, you have all of these citizens just cutting down you know, their crops and burning them and driving off their cattle and leaving the British with no supplies. Not just They're not just fighting the people with guns and uniforms, they're fighting you know, everybody in the country, everybody that supports the Patriots. The plan, like I said, of the three British groups meeting up was beginning to fail, and no one was going to be meeting up to help Burgoyne's troops in Albany. He is counting on this. He is thinking, you know, we are weak right now, but once we get closer to Albany, we'll meet up with Lager or Howell, and they'll have some supplies and some reinforcements, and everything will be all right. Um, but that is just not what's going to happen. Burgoyne is still marching um, south, but he is running out of supplies. When he gets closer to Albany, he runs into an American force led by Horatio Gates, and Horatio Gates and the, his American troops block the way to Albany, and this battle goes on for a few weeks, and the British are forced to retreat back to an old fort at Saratoga. By this time, the British were exhausted. The British surrounded or the Americans surrounded the British at Saratoga and attacked all day and night. And these are the battles of Saratoga. The battles at Saratoga are what we would call a turning point in the war because the British are forced to surrender. And what this does is it's like the first major big victory that the Americans have. And it's basically the British were not able to divide the states. They weren't able to cut New England off from the rest of the colonies. And the other European countries, um, like the, uh, mainly the French and the Spanish, realized that the Americans might just win, which it's a turning point because, because of this battle, the French decide, hey, maybe we will join in the war, help the Americans, and help them defeat the British. It's kind of like a turning point. It's like the shift in momentum. It's like the event during the war that shifts the momentum towards the American side because things start going our way. And, um, you know, it's just like a big turnover or a big shot in a, uh, in a basketball or a football game or a big touchdown or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, that's lecture one. Um, in lecture two, we will focus on the... Th the outcomes of the Saratoga and, you know, the outcomes of the French and the Spanish entering the war for the Americans.